We take it for granted today, but information on anything was limited for most of human history. Even as recent as 20 years ago, information is still limited. The information wasn't robust, and what you could really find on things like Wikipedia was really the only more popular stuff, and really nothing you couldn't find outside of the normal library. On top of that, internet hoaxes were fairly common back then, with people not really knowing what was true and what was not on the internet. So if you were a kid in this era and you want to learn about something niche, something like dinosaurs, well, what do you do? For starters, you could pick up a book from the local library, or in the same library, pick up a recording in that staple of that era. The Dinosaur Documentary Hello, I'm Professor Ginko, and today we are talking about the golden age of dinosaur documentary. Before we go into this decade of documentaries that happened between 1999 and 2011, I want to tell you that this is not an accuracy review. There are plenty of YouTube videos about this, instead this is a retrospective. I want to look back and see how such an iconic part of paleo media evolved and changed over the time. A lot of documentaries haven't aged well with the modern knowledge of dinosaurs, that is not a hot take. However, I find there is a value in looking back. Documentaries, along with paleo media in general, have this interesting time capsule effect. Old paleo media shows not only our knowledge of dinosaurs at the time, but it reflects our evolving knowledge of the field and the perceptions of dinosaurs that are popular in those years. So with that out of the way, before we talk about the Golden Age documentaries, let's start with how it started. For that, we need to go a little further back to 1993. The year is 1969, and John Ostrom has just finished describing Dionychus. The dinosaur, despite looking fairly standard today, contradicted how people had been depicting dinosaurs for years. Instead of being slow and plodding, it's smaller, quicker, and maybe a bit smarter than the others. The single dinosaur helped kick off what's called the dinosaur renaissance. It took word to get around, but soon enough, instead of the standard Victorian era of dinosaurs being slow, powerful, and just plodding beasts, dinosaurs after that were depicted as fast, intelligent, and maybe emotional. However, for as long as it took for word to spread around paleontology, in general, it took a lot longer for things to spread around the general public. Not, you know, everyone was interested in dinosaurs, and people that were, were almost limited to only kids. Back in those days, if you really wanted to learn something, you had to buy an encyclopedia, or if you were lucky, watch a documentary. 1985 Dinosaur was one of the better documentaries that came, honestly, carrying the knowledge of the dinosaur renaissance era, and it's from this that the modern documentary, I think, is spawned. Featuring stop motion from Pale Tippett, the documentary was narrated by Christopher Reeves of Superman himself, and it actually won an Emmy for its amazing special effects. Now, this happened pretty far back behind the Golden Age. However, in my opinion, it is one of the more influential documentaries of its era, and without it, the modern landscape of dinosaur documentaries I would imagine would look pretty different, actually. Despite the age science, it holds up, in my opinion, fairly well. And you really could tell the amount of passion that shined throughout this entire documentary. It has a lot of charm to it that I really can't explain. Dinosaurs did its best to show people that didn't know a lot about dinosaurs, discoveries of the past 20 years and it did that extremely well. Stop motion holds up and does a great job of showing dinosaurs not as lumbering brutes as we mentioned, but as just animals, just active, smart, intelligent animals. I can't really understate how important it was for documentaries of this age to point out this entire fact. Although it was unsaid today, it was a concept that was very important to share for a while. The old Victorian era of dinosaurs being just outdated, big dumb monsters, was something that was actually pretty common and had to be stated for a good chunk of paleo media at this time. Overall, it has a lot of heart that I didn't really expect to see looking this far back, and I would highly recommend it if you're interested in the retro paleo media. Dinosaur wasn't the only documentary before the Golden Age, however. PBS in 1992 made the Dinosaurs, and TLC in 1994 aired Paleo World. They also did their best to inform people, and they did a pretty good job. The Dinosaurs was a four-part miniseries, instead of what was common with stop motion, uh, it used animation to depict its dinosaurs. Halo World was a four season long series created for a television lineup instead of the hour long showings that most of the time documentaries do. I don't have a lot of experience with the dinosaurs, I watched like a few episodes to prepare myself for this video, but I did watch a good chunk of Halo World, or rather, its kids friendly spin off Bonehead Detectives of the Halo World on Discovery Kids back when I was a child. It had a pretty interesting niche, not to mention. Um, there has been a lot of shows made for small 30 minute block episodes for dinosaurs, and the variety of topics were pretty extensive, honestly, especially for the time. Uh, despite being fondly remembered, these aren't the most important paleo media in the early 90s. Um, there is one a bit more iconic, one would say, 
Despite being fondly remembered, these weren't the most important paid media of the early 90s. Instead, in 1993, it wasn't a documentary that showed the discoveries to the general public, but instead, the silver screen. Dinosaurs have always had a level of fame to them in Hollywood. Ever since start with Gary the Dinosaur, who was one of the first animated icons of its era, to classics like The Lost World and King Kong, if you wanted a setting to look savage or primal, you really couldn't go wrong with adding a dinosaur. But 1993's Jurassic Park took things to the next level in more ways than one. You know Jurassic Park is not a documentary, it is the opposite of what it's there for entertainment instead of sharing knowledge. However, I should mention that it did more for the image of dinosaurs among the public than arguably documentaries before it. Uh, the reason was twofold. For starters, it had used the discoveries of the dinosaur renaissance to make active, threatening dinosaurs. Although synonymous with inaccurate dinosaurs for now, at the time, Jurassic Park had pretty accurate dinosaurs, honestly. Instead of the kangaroo pose T-Rex was known for before this, T-Rex stood in an accurate pose that we still use today. Velociraptor was pretty obscure before this, same with Dilophosaurus, but now both are almost as iconic, or in Velociraptor's term, just as iconic as Triceratops and T-Rex even if their Velociraptor was far too big. Despite all the flaws, like the printed wrists, which are horribly wrong, and the Dinosaurus frill, Jurassic Park really wanted dinosaurs to come to life on screen. Spielberg even worked with paleontologists like Jack Horner to get them as life life as possible, and these dinosaurs really helped cement the modern dinosaur into the general public more than documentaries would, which are made for niche audiences. The second major change Jurassic Park brought was revolutionary not just for dinosaur documentaries but for film in general, and that was CGI. For CGI, a lot of things like dinosaurs had to be depicted, really just hand-drawn animation or stop motion. Animation was pretty time-consuming and it didn't really mesh with live-action shots unless you were Roger Rabbit. Stop motion took a lot more time, but it fit in a live-action shot decently enough, but CGI really just opened the entire Pandora's box of whatever you want to do. You share worlds of fantasy, far off worlds, or worlds long in the past. Jurassic Park sparked imagination around dinosaurs with the general public, and that plus CGI taken off meant that it didn't take long for the first documentary with CGI to rear its head. 1999 is where the golden age starts, but we're going to be a little earlier than that. When dinosaurs rule tends to be left in the dust when people talk about this era. Unfortunately, it walked in the shadow of what came next to it. Honestly, it's a fairly standard documentary, and I think it holds up pretty decently, all things considered. It did help teach new discoveries to interested minds. It does a few interesting things, like it's the first one with CG I could tell, which although it hasn't aged phenomenally, it's not bad for 1999. Also, in order to capitalize on Jurassic Park's fame, they brought Jeff Goldblum to narrate it. North America was the real Jurassic Park. He did a pretty decent job, all things considered. He's no Christopher Reeve, though. Uh, there's occasional awkward read here and there. It's not phoning it in, I feel. I think they just left some weird takes in. It happens. The documentary isn't bad, not by a long shot, but it's forgotten mainly because the same year this documentary series was in, another documentary series ushered what I would consider to be the Golden Age, one that showed what dance documentaries could really be, one that had you travel back in time long before man back across 65 million years. Although ever since the Bone Wars, dinosaur media has pretty much had a home in the United States. The Golden Age was brought in by the country that birthed paleontology and dinomania, England. Head of BBC Science at the time, Janet Bennett, was looking for new science programming. Physically, she wanted science programs to do documentaries, what Jurassic Park did for films. Tim Haynes, a zoologist, had an idea. Originally, the concept was a history of paleontology with some CGI reconstructions here and there. Jurassic Park, though, showed what paleontology was really capable of, so instead they thought bigger. Instead, they thought it as a natural history program, similar to BBC Earth, 65 in the years of the making. Originally for CGI, they went for the famous Industrial Light and Magic. It really made sense considering their prestige. After all, they were founded by George Lucas, and they worked on a large number of the movie, including Jurassic Park itself. But they're pretty outpriced at $10,000 a second, so BBC had to think a bit smaller. Originally, they thought nature scenes with easier plant and insects, the occasional interspurted dinosaur here and there, but luckily for them, UK-based company Frame Store gave a much more reasonable price. At first, they realized that they might be copying a loss here, 
if they weren't careful about it, but they also knew there's something special about this project. If they threw it away, they knew they just might regret it. So, CG Company found, Tim Haynes pitched a six episode series, runtime of 30 minutes for each episode, and with this pitch, he also gave a working title, Walking with Dinosaurs. It took two years to research the documentary and about 18 months to produce. For most people, the background of a documentary like this is just white noise. Dinosaurs go to front, and in general, the background isn't thought of. When shooting the production team needed two things. For starters, they needed a place with Mesozoic remnants, that is, places that were rich with plants that thrived in the day of the dinosaur. And the second one was they needed to have no grass in sight. This might sound like a strange requirement, but it was assumed back then that grasses didn't evolve until after the Cretaceous. Nowadays, we know that the grasses evolved during the late Cretaceous, but for accuracy's sake, during that time they needed to make sure that grasses would not be able to be seen in those shots. So, limits in mind, they had to draw up a map with different locations to shoot. The locations chose were Tasmania, New Zealand, California, New Caledonia, Chile, and the Bahamas. All of those led to a globe try expedition of shooting the footage. Meanwhile, CGI artists were there trying to give life to the dinosaurs that have long been gone. The CGI artists had to work with paleontologists about muscle attachments, tendons, and movements. Living animals were used for reference about movements, because in general, dinosaurs are pretty extinct, and not kind of the non avian ones. For example, elephants were used, since they are the largest living land animal. Of course, there was a good chunk of speculation and creative license taken, of course, but when you're recreating an animal that's been extinct for so long, some creative license is kind of needed. Meanwhile, the BBC was buying their nails. The video was ambitious, but it was also extremely high risk with every minute of the documentary costing over $60,000 to film, and with it costing around $10 million to film in total, it's understandable to be a little nervous at that price range. So how did Walking Dinosaurs work? Did it fail or did it succeed like intended? Oh yeah, of course it succeeded. I wouldn't be uh, talking about it if it didn't succeed. It was, a, it was a smash hit, one might say. Walking Dinosaurs, in my opinion, was groundbreaking for its time, and it is probably the documentary people think of when the words dinosaur documentary are said. Prior to this point, dinosaur documentaries had a cute balance between dinosaurs and specialists. Claymation was pretty time consuming and expensive, so you really couldn't have a all claymation documentary with the amount of time and the amount of same time that you could with CG. Mocha dinosaurs, for the first time ever, put their stars in front and center. Stylized like a nature documentary. No paleontologists, no geologists, just uh, computer generated animals with the occasional animal live acting. Now, for documentaries like this, it's pretty much the goal to show animals that were extinct like they're living and breathing. Walking dinosaurs show that although dinosaurs went extinct, CGI could be used to give a bit of a window in the past. In addition, the documentary just was well done. Everything is well polished, including the amazing soundtrack and narration. Narrated by Kenneth Branagh, the CGI was groundbreaking when it came out, although it's predated by today's standards. The animatronics in some shots helped sell some scenes here and there. People loved it. It had about 15 million viewers in the first episode, which was a lot back then. Critics, however, were slightly a bit harsher. Most enjoyed it. Others saw it as technically impressive, but didn't like how much speculation the series did. One person in particular was worried the BBC would turn more juvenile, saying, I begin to think the entire thing is geared to selling chocolate dinosaur egg to five-year-olds. Despite the chocolate egg selling, it won a good amount of rewards, and it even won actually two Emmys. But how's it stand up today? Well, I mentioned the CG is still pretty good today. Uh, it's not great, of course, but it still holds up. The designs in particular, in my opinion, are really well done. I think the Coelophysis, the Allosaurus, and the Leopleurodon are some of the more iconic dinosaur designs out there. The T-Rex, unfortunately, less so. I don't think it's a hot take to say this is one of the worst T-Rex we've had in a documentary. In addition, the nature documentary style really stands the test of time. As cliche as it is to say, these animals really do feel like they're alive. Science age, less so. 20 years of discoveries will kind of do that to a documentary like this, especially since back then there were a few oddities that were put in there despite knowledge otherwise. The most well known of them being the massive Onychirus and Leopleurodon, which are comically oversized. I'm not going to go over all of them, however, but if you want to go over them, Benji Thomas did an amazing series where he went over every single miss. I highly recommend it. Although it's not perfect by any means, Walking Dinosaurs sparked a love of dinosaurs among a lot of the children who grew up with it, myself included. I cannot stress enough the impact the series had on my generation of paleontology lovers and the next generation of paleontologists. If I had to recommend some episodes, 
I'd recommend. One of my favorites definitely has to be Cruel Sea. I love me an ocean episode. Honestly, some of my favorites. In addition, Giants of the Skies was just really cool. New York Kakaira is one of the more iconic dinosaurs in the series. Finally, I think I would have to say Spirits of the Ice Forest. You know, when you're a kid, all you think about are the poles are polar bears and penguin. So when you're told as a kid that there were dinosaurs on the poles at one point, it just blows the young kid's mind. The VC did not wrestle with laurels, however. Next year's special would air. We focus on one dinosaur, MLR 693, or to their friends, Big Al. Now, Big Al had the making of a celebrity already. 95% of his skeleton was preserved, which is very impressive. He also lived a very intense life, had several broken ribs and a toe infection. And also, like most celebrities of their caliber, they died pretty young. So, the Ballad of Big Al aired. The Ballad of Big Al was pretty much the same as the main series, so nothing too different, but in my opinion, it chose the right dinosaur to focus. I've always been a fan of the Allosaurus design and walking dinosaurs. In my opinion, it is one of the most iconic. I love the green color, the gray stripes, and the red crests. Overall, this special was pretty good. Practically an extra episode, but still worth a watch. In 2001, when Dinosaurs Road America aired, the show almost seems a little like, in hindsight, a direct response to Discovery, although I do know that there is a fair amount of pre-production in the works. There's an interesting thing though if you look at release dates. Ever since Walking Dinosaurs, after this point, there's a bit of a back and forth between Discovery and BBC. Every time BBC releases a documentary, Discovery follows up with one of their own. I might be looking a little too into it, admittedly, but it seems like there's a bit of a friendly rivalry between the two. A battle between who is the champion of the dinosaurs? US or the UK? So, does this documentary hold up on its own? Well, in my opinion, it really does. Although the CG has aged worse than Walking With, I do think this is a worthy rival. The dinosaur designs are pretty good. I love the Stratosaurus, I think it looks very good. I love the Big Dilophosaurus design, little scutes on it, and the awesome metallic roar that was just so weird, and I think is really cool. Instead of going around the globe, as the name would suggest, it stays in the gold US of A. Uh, it's not just patriotism. America actually has a good chunk of the iconic dancers of the world and has a good amount of bone beds. And it's not just a CGI nature documentary like Walking Wet. Around a few key points, the documentary cuts to a formation where the rocks are from, talks to a paleontologist, or my favorite part, it would cut away at the dinosaurs and look at the different bone and muscles of the dinosaur and the adaptations it would have at that level. It's something that was actually thrown around in Walking with conceptualized, and it's pretty cool to see another documentary of its kind. They're also pretty cool additions, I really do like seeing it honestly, even nowadays. And it's really cool to see younger paleontologists that are actually... When a Dinosaurs Roamed though is a fairly violent dinosaur documentary, it's you know, not super violent. You know, there's a fair amount of predation and action moment. One epic I had, a lot of these predators seems to have them hunting and not much else. They don't do a lot of things outside of hunting and killing, and I would like to see a little bit of, you know, fluff. It's not excessive, just a small nitpick here and there. When Dinosaurs Roamed America was also notable because it had the first appearance of a feathered dinosaur in a documentary, which was very cool. Overall, it's pretty good. There's a few inaccuracies here and there, of course. The wrists are wrong half the time. Dinosaur wrists didn't face palm down, but they are positioned in a way that the dinosaur is about to clap. The misconception that Jurassic Park made popular, and this series which team both for some reason. In addition, the random raptor is placed in the Zuni formation for some reason. None are found in the Zuni formation, and it's not like they misplaced a raptor species, they just made up a raptor. And that raptor dies because it was too busy eating to pay attention to the fire. Uh, although, despite the weird fire scene, I did like the raptor in there, it's pretty cool. I like that feather design. It seems it has some fun, it's just putting in there is very weird. But despite the fault, in my opinion, it is a worthy rival to Walking with Dinosaurs. Unfortunately, 2001 wasn't all that good for documentaries. In September of that year, Valley of the T-Rex released as a follow-up to When Dinosaurs Roamed. An entire documentary based around the T-Rex scavenger hypothesis, championed by Jack Horner. Jack Horner is a controversial figure in paleontology, to say the least. Although, it cannot be understated that he did help shape public perception of dinosaurs during the dinosaur renaissance by uncovering dinosaur parental care and advising Steven Spielberg in Jurassic Park. He is also known for sharing hypotheses that seem very out there, almost like he's throwing them at the wall to see what sticks. Some might call it a bit too contrarian, 
an attitude that was probably born out of when our understanding of dinosaurs wasn't as strong and was based off of hardline Victorian understanding that dinosaurs were somehow inferior to mammals, um, but nowadays it's almost harmful to the field to some extent. T-Rex's scavenger hypothesis was his most infamous one, and even back then it had really flimsy evidence. You could look at Red Raptor Wright's video on this for a more in-detail debunking, but just know that the nail in the coffin was that when a T-Rex tooth was found in a hydrosaur that was later healed around it. We know that scavengers don't eat things when they're alive, so it shows that a T-Rex bit a hadrosaur, tooth came off, hadrosaur lived. For some reason though, uh, Jack Carter has never really backed down from his hypothesis, and he mentions nowadays that it could have done both, but he's still confident in the scavenging Rex enough to sell it as the NFT, so it's not completely backed out from it. I don't know why he believes that T-Rex didn't go after smaller prey, considering that going after younger smaller prey is that Jack Carter knows to do well, but I digress. A documentary's main goal should be report information, and I shouldn't bring his personal life into this, so let's go over this. Now, we mentioned that the information is already pretty spotty, uh, so that's one shot against it, but is the documentary well made? Well, not really. Um, the CG is pretty much the same from when dinosaurs roamed, the narration isn't as good either. Although the documentary should be about T-Rex, the narration half the time types up Jack Horner as a gray's paleontologist alive, a lone man, a bold enough to say the truth that no one would. And what Horner is finding sets him apart from a hundred years of popular belief. Uh, Jack Horner for the most part is fine, I would say though. He isn't jerking himself off, although his reasoning is a bit flimsy. Even someone who would know nothing about dinosaurs would see a bit of problems with this stuff. For example, he mentions that raptors would be the apex predators of Hell Creek, but it's kind of weird seeing the size difference between them and Triceratops. In addition, he says that due to our knowledge of the animals being anatomy only, that any definitive answer we can make about them that is not anatomy is in part imagination. And then about 10 minutes later, he says that believing T-Rex is a predator is bad science with 100% proof that it's a scavenger. Figuring out what dinosaurs were like as living creatures, how they walked, um, what color they were, we don't know. We are at sort of at the mercy of our own imaginations. The best thing that we can say based on the evidence is that T-Rex was 100% scavenger. So yeah, not super good. The documentary isn't completely insalvageable, however. I did enjoy the geology part of the documentary. It was pretty cool actually to see a day in the life of the dino dig until Horner talks about his weird hypothesis. Things back and forth between, oh, this is pretty cool too. Oh, here's Horner shilling himself again. I also think Horner's redesigned T-Rex is a pretty new design all things considered. It's big and bulky, similar to reconstructions we have now. He he did the work wrong, but he somehow got the right answer, so that's cool. In addition, I like the red-headed, black-bodied Rex. Though the red helm design, in my opinion, is just a design that really works on T-Rex. I can do that the weirdly detailed saliva, that's disgusting, take, take that away. Overall, the value of the T-Rex is kind of disappointing and very preachy, but wasn't the worst thing to happen in September of 2001. So, that just leaves two fan favorite documentaries. One special, and one that is less special. Where to go from there? Well, BBC's last documentary ended with the end of the dinosaurs. So logically, plan to pick up from the end. The next documentary planned would be one a bit more recent than Walking with Dinosaurs. It would be one of the first documentaries of this kind. See, instead of Walking with Dinosaurs, you'd walk with beasts.